Okay, so we're going to continue our discussion of Hume's notion of the self, or the idea of the self. Now, when we left off, we were about to discuss his idea of the object. So he has this argument by analogy with regard to objects, which he begins on page 49. And he actually prefaces this discussion of our idea of the object by explaining that in order for us to understand the idea of the self, we have to first understand the idea of plants and animals. And in order to understand them, we should understand our idea of objects, right? So on page 49, he says, um, to explain it perfectly, and by it he means our idea of the self, we must take the matter pretty deep and account for that identity which we attribute to plants and animals, there being a great analogy betwixt it and the identity of a self or person. Right? So he wants to take on the argument by analogy about the plants and animals. But to get there, he wants to simplify it even further. He says, let's just talk about objects. We don't even have to talk about things that are alive. Let's just talk about objects. So on page 49, he begins this discussion of the object. Right? And the actual text reads, We have a distinct idea of an object that remains invariable and uninterrupted through a supposed variation of time. And this idea we call that of identity or sameness. We have also a distinct idea of several different objects existing in succession and connected together by a close relation. And this and this, to an accurate view, affords as perfect a notion of diversity as if there was no manner of relation among the objects. But though these two ideas of identity and a succession of related objects be in themselves perfectly distinct and even contrary, yet to certain that in our common way of thinking they are generally confounded with each other. That act of the imagination by which we consider the uninterrupted an invariable object, and that by which we reflect on the succession of related objects are almost the same to the feeling, nor is there much more effort of thought required in the latter case than in the former. The relation facilitates the transition of the mind from one object to another and renders its passage as smooth as if contemplated one continued object. This resemblance is the cause of the confusion and mistake and makes us substitute the notion of identity instead of that of related objects. Okay, so let's, let's outline this argument, right? Just this first part that we read, right? And paragraph 4, page 49 in the text, right? We have a distinct idea we call identity of an object that remains invariable and uninterrupted through a supposed variation of time. So this is where he's defining identity for us, right? His notion, his idea of identity. Second premise. We have another idea that we call diversity. And so you see here in the, in the outline, I've condensed his, his language, removed some of the obfuscation, made it a little clearer, right? So we have another idea that we call diversity. This idea, quote, is of several different objects existing in succession and connected together by a close relation, right? Now, his argument then is that although these two ideas, identity and diversity, are distinct, and actually he says contrary to one another, they are generally confounded. What does that mean? We generally confuse one for the other, right? So we can't seem to distinguish in our mind the idea of diversity from the idea of identity. And he explains this in the, in the paragraph I just read by you know, arguing that, well, they're so similar that it's very easy for our mind to kind of move from one to the other, right? So what is he talking about, right? He's talking about this object. This object exists, and then we have these impressions. Some of them are a diversity of impressions, right? Several different impressions of the object, right? Diversity, several different objects existing in succession. Right? So you can imagine that each of these is an impression of the object at a different point in time. And then identity, right, is this idea of one object that moves through time but remains the same. Right? So he says we confuse these two in order to come up with our idea of the object. Right? Now, he talks about three different ways in which we confuse identity with diversity, right? Causation, resemblance, 
and contiguity. Right? And then he gives another a number of analogies or examples which demonstrate each of these t you know, c types of mistakes that we make. Right? So, like in this first example of the object, it's possible that if objects are close together, that we could, you know, mistake one for the other. Right? In this particular, you know, first example he gives, he talks about resemblance, right? That when two things resemble one another, we can imagine that they are the same thing. And so here's, a, here's an example he gives. You know, the river, right? Um, he gives an example of the river, and for some of you who've, who've read some philosophy before, you may be familiar with Heraclitus, right? Heraclitus is a famous Greek philosopher who's known for having said, you never step into the same river twice, right? Because each time you step into the river, the river has already changed. Right? But the river looks like the same river, right? So we might imagine that each time we step into the river, we're stepping into the same river. In fact, we might say, you know, I'm stepping into the Ohio River. And whether it's today or tomorrow or next week, it's still the Ohio River, right? So we give the river an identity which transcends its diversity. So despite the fact that at each moment there is a different river, because the river resembles other rivers, other impressions we had of the Ohio River, we call it all one river, right? So we have this mistake we make of mistaking resemblance for identity. That because it looks the same, it must be the same, right? Another example we have is of a film strip. Now, Hume actually gives an example of the theater, but I thought I'd modernize the example so it's more relatable, right? So you can imagine going to the theater. He talks about going to the theater and... Um, watching the characters move on stage and um, kind of mistaking the different acts of the play as all belonging to one play, something like this. But what I think is even... a better example, right, is... right, we got this person doing acrobatics in a film, okay? So... As we're watching the film, we actually see a person doing a flip, right? But everybody knows that the way film is made is that it's actually a series of still shots which are strung together and then pushed through a projector very quickly to give us the illusion of movement, right? So actually a film is composed of just these moments in time, right? These very brief impressions. Right? But because we run them at a fast rate and because they're very close together, we imagine that these, some, these singular impressions right, can all be run together into one identity of this person doing a flip. Right? And what Hume would say is that this is similar to the way in which we mistake impressions of the self or impressions of the river or impressions of, of other objects um, that we mistake kind of a diversity or a succession of impressions, right? This is a succession of impressions, right? But then we mistake it for one impression, right? Because as we're watching the film, we see the movement, the motion. We don't see the distinct impressions. They're going too fast. And so our mind actually kind of tricks us into thinking that all of these individual impressions are really only one impression, right? And so... Hume would say this is an example of this mistake, right? This confusion that we make between diversity and succession, diversity and identity, right? And that mistake is a result, in this case, of contiguity, right? Because these impressions are so close together, and contiguity is, is you know, something that's close together. So things are lined up next to each other, right? Close, touching right, that contiguity can cause us to make this mistake. Now, Hume's not that interested in contiguity because he doesn't think it's as relevant to our concept of the self. But he, he mentions it as one possibility. And then he goes on to talk about causation and resemblance. And he gives some other examples. So he talks about the church. You may remember that he gives an example of church where he talks about this church, right, and that's supposed to be a steeple or something, right? 
So we have this church, and Hume talks about how the church is destroyed. Maybe there's an earthquake or something. I forget the details. But the church is destroyed, and it's completely, you know, leveled. And the community of the church decides to, you know, have a little roof-raising fund, and they raise money, and they erect a new church, right? And, and it's actually a completely different church. I mean, it's using different bricks, different mortar. Um, it's a completely different church, right? And yet the parishioners of this church would say that, oh, this is the same church, right? It's the same exact church. And the reason that we mistake this new church for the old church, right, is because the same cause was involved. So the people that created the first church, the community, the parishioners, also created the second church, right? And so this would be an example for Hume of a mistake that we make by causation. That we assume because this object and the previous object, right, this church and the, the previous church have the same cause, that they have the same identity, right? Um, so these, all of these examples he gives are meant to try to explain his position. And his position is, is, is essentially that we make a mistake, right? We make a mistake when we confuse identity from succession, right? We see a diversity of impressions, and we mistakenly attribute something to it that gives us the impression it's an identity, right? Now, when it comes to plants and animals, which is on, let's see, what page is that? On page 50... You know, the analogy to plants and animals is a lot more similar to humans, right? Because they're alive. Um, that, and, you know, so he explains that this, this, this confusion we make is um, such that we even have to invent explanations, right? And the, the invention we come up with on page 50 is this whole, whole idea of a soul, right? So... He writes, quote, Thus we feign the continued existence of the perceptions of our senses to remove the interruption. So we have these perceptions, and they're actually interrupted, right? There's a perception, there's perception, there's perception, and there are interruptions between them, right? But we want to feign no interruption, according to Hume, right? We want to imagine that all of these perceptions are, are continuous, right? We feign the continued existence of the perceptions of our senses to remove the interruption, and run into the notion of a soul and self and substance to disguise the variation. So for Hume, the very notion of a self, which is similar to the notion of a soul, is a result of our need, our need to create, right? We need to create some sort of, some sort of connection between these distinct impressions, right? But we may further observe, he continues, that where we do not give rise to such a fiction, our propension to confound identity with relation is so great that we are apt to imagine something unknown and mysterious connecting the parts beside their relation. And this I take to be the case with regard to the identity as ascribed to plants and animals. Sorry, plants and vegetables. Right? And even when this does not take place, we still feel a propensity to confound these ideas, though we are not able fully to satisfy ourselves in that particular, nor find anything invariable and uninterrupted to justify our notion of identity. So he's talking about plants and vegetables, sorry, not animals. And he, he, he actually wants to argue that, it's, that it's, it's foolish of us to come up with this notion of a soul to explain a plant, right? And the plant example you know, is one where he talks about how we might see a plant right? and over time we have these different impressions. My lovely plant. <laughs> Maybe it's a broccoli, huh? So these are for Hume distinct impressions of a plant. But we decide that this is all the same plant. These are just different moments in time of the same plant. And in order to make sense of this, we have to attribute something to the plant which does not change. Because everything about the plant's physical appearance changes over time, right? 
even from day to day, from month to month, the plant completely changes. You can have an acorn, right, that turns into an oak tree. So, I mean, how can you say that the acorn and the oak tree are the same thing when they just, they bear no resemblance to each other, right? And, you know, we have this series of impressions over time. And so what we tend to do is we tend to come up with this kind of essence, this notion that there is something about this plant, its plantness, which transcends its physical changes, right? And we tend to do that with ourselves, right? That although if you look at pictures of me from when I'm 5 and 10 and 15 and 20 and 40 and 45, that you're going to find that there may be huge differences, right? Um, a different height, different weight, my hair is different lengths, uh, my, nose is, my nose and mouth and eyes have different shapes, um, my body has different shapes over time, and yet I'm convinced that all of these impressions, all of these photographs are of the same exact person, right? And that no matter how much my body changes, if I were to, you know, have a, a terrible accident and have all of my limbs amputated or become seriously scarred and have my face completely changed to a different face, develop vertiligo and, and have my skin change colors, that regardless of any, you know, extreme physical changes in my appearance, that I'm still somehow the same person, right? And for Hume, this is a mistake, right? This is a mistake between a succession of perceptions, right, a diversity of perceptions, and an identity of perceptions.